Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and as we move right along with A.P. Hill, we see him in winter quarters into the spring of 1863, when he would take part in the Battle of Chancellorsville. During January 1863, Hill's men were marched to witness the execution of Private Patrick McGee of the 1st Virginia for desertion, robbery, and perjury. For a short time, Hill was the president of a court-martial for the 1st Corps. When it concluded, he forwarded this message to Longstreet. I send you over the record in the case of Youngblood, whom we have directed to be executed. If the sentence meets the approval of the general, I would suggest that the sentence be published at once to the army, and also that the prisoner be notified at once of his fate. Our desire to promote the efficiency of the service and its proper discipline, and suggestions coming from the lieutenant general, are always received with pleasure and never regarded as any incursion of our privileges, and I hope no hesitancy will be felt in freely making them. The destruction of Fredericksburg during the battle caused many Confederate soldiers to feel sorrow for the citizens. Hill's Lot Division donated $10,000 to their relief. While in winter quarters, as always, Dolly was not far behind Hill. She made her and the kids a home in a house a few yards away from Hill's headquarters. Dolly was now pregnant again and contracted diphtheria during this winter, but after it ran its course, she was back to her old self. In mid-February, on one of the trips Hill took to Richmond, the Virginia House of Delegates made him an honorary member. Hill told the delegates, The knowledge that what little I have done in the service of my country is appreciated by the legislature of my native state is sufficient to nerve my arm in the future. I shall endeavor to merit the appreciation so generously bestowed. Hill also had to change the command structure. Colonel Brockenbrow had not filled the shoes of General Field when he took over the Brigadier's unit temporarily. Hill had to replace him, and he did so with Henry Heath, his childhood friend and West Point classmate. Hill had also been a groomsman at Heath's wedding in 1857. Now he had to replace General Gregg. He knew that the South Carolinians were some of his best fighters, and Gregg taught them well. So he had to choose a capable commander, and he did. He chose Colonel Samuel McGowan of the 14th South Carolina. Cheers went up from the brigade when his promotion was announced. During the first four months of 1863, the Hill-Jackson feud hit a whole new level. Lee attempted to squash the feud by informing Hill that Jackson did accept his release. Hill still wanted to be vindicated. Only a court of inquiry could decide if he had been right in his actions. Two events brought the feud to a bowl. One, Jackson's chief of ordnance bypassed Hill to inform Hill's chief of ordnance to perform a small task. Hill took this as Jackson breaking military protocol. Lee even informed Hill that if army orders had to pass through that many hands, it would add considerable red tape and make the army less efficient. Then an information leak happened in Jackson's Signal Corps. Lee wanted to know who leaked the information that was being widely discussed in Hill's light division. Jackson found out it was Hill's signal officer who had leaked the information and relieved him of duty without informing Hill. When Hill did find this out, he was irate that again Jackson interfered with his division without the division commander's knowledge. Somehow a communication was put on Jackson's desk. It was a note from Hill telling his signal officer to ignore orders from Jackson unless they came through him first. To Jackson, this was insubordination. Jackson sent over all documents for Lee to look over, as did Hill, but Lee was more worried about the upcoming campaign. It was late April, and the fighting would soon commence. Jeb Stuart detected the movement of Joseph Hooker's army as it left a third of its force under John Sedgwick at Fredericksburg, while he marched the rest to the cross the Rappahannock River to the west. Lee had to move quickly. By April 30th, Hill's division was on the road to meet the Federal Army in a densely wooded area known as the Wilderness. Lee, Jackson, and Hill looked over maps and it was determined that Hill would proceed down the Orange Turnpike to the crossroads at Chancellorsville to fill out the enemy. The brigades of Lane, Heath, and McGowan marched west and became hotly engaged. Jackson summoned Hill to ride with him to the front. He did so, and as they got closer to the fighting, Hill dismounted. A soldier remembered Hill was standing with several officers around him. He was holding the reins of his horse bridle in his left hand and was talking rapidly and at the same time gesticulating vigorously with his right hand. We passed near enough to him to note his earnest manner. 
I remember that his presence and manner inspired me with confidence, for he impressed me with the conviction that he was a man whose spirit was rising as dangers gathered and thickened, that he meant business, and that he was going to win. Hooker had lost his nerve and was now in the wilderness on the defensive. Stuart brought information to Lee that Hooker's flank was not anchored, it was in the air. Lee instructed Jackson to take his 28,000 men and march to the Union right flank and hit it with all the force he could. On the morning of May 2nd, the divisions of Rhodes, Colston, and Hill moved out to make the march. The Light Division was in the rear. After marching miles to get into position, Rhodes formed the first line, Colston's division was behind him, and Hill was forming up his men, but the day was getting late, and part of his division had engaged briefly with the Federals, so his brigades were more strung out than the other two divisions. At 5.15 p.m., Jackson launched his assault with only two-thirds of his force. Jackson's corps slammed into the unsuspecting Federals, and the chase was on. Lost in the glory of Jackson's greatest flank attack is the fact that it was rather badly organized and somewhat mismanaged. Rhodes swept ahead with Colston only 150 yards behind him. As a result, when a segment of Rhodes' line slowed down from obstacles or fatigue, a portion of Colston's line bumped into it. Further, Hill's brigades were still deploying when the assault began, and were of no use in the first stage of the battle. All too quickly, the sharpness of Jackson's offensive broke down. By 7.30, Jackson's powerful assault had lost most of its momentum. Jackson still had one division unengaged, the Light Division. He called up for Hill to bring his division to the front and push northeast to cut the Federals off from the fords across the rivers to the north. Lane's North Carolinians were in the lead, deployed across the plank road. It was now 8.30 and a full moon was peeking through the trees. Lane directed his men to fire on the first men they saw coming. Even with the moon, it was still too dark to move any great distance, so Lane rode to find Hill to get further instructions. Lane found Jackson riding slowly down the road. He told Jackson he needed further instructions, and Jackson stated, Push right ahead, Lane. Hill with his staff then came running down the road to meet with Jackson. The calm that had marked Jackson all the trying day was gone. He was now excited. He sensed the kill if pressure against the Federals could be maintained. Jackson returned Hill's salute and asked, How long before you will be ready to advance? In a few minutes, Hill replied, as soon as I can finish relieving General Rhodes. Jackson asked, Do you know the road from Chancellorsville to the United States Ford? Hill paused for a second. I have not traveled over it for many years. Jackson then turned in his saddle to his young engineering officer. Captain Boswell, report to General Hill. Then Jackson looked hard at Hill and exclaimed, Press them, General Hill. Press them and cut them off from the United States Ford. At 9.15, the Light Division began groping through the dark unknown. Jackson and his staff rode behind the 18th North Carolina during its slow advance, then passed through its lines. An officer asked, General, don't you think this is the wrong place for you? The danger is all over. The enemy is routed, Jackson shouted. Go back until A.P. Hill to press right on. 